Hi, this is Pastor Ben. As you may or may not know, for the last number of years, our church has supported a missionary named Kathy Vandekloot. And uh, just this past year, we received news that she is retiring from her work in missions. Normally, in a regular year, we would receive visits from her. And on this occasion of her retiring, we would actually get a visit from her in church after the service. Um, but given the fact that we're not meeting physically, uh, Kathy and I talked back and forth a little bit and decided that the maybe the best thing to do instead was for me to have a little interview with her about her ministry and about um, how it's kind of come to a close. Um, so what you're going to see here is uh, my conversation with Kathy, um, just kind of giving an overview of some things and, and of how things have wrapped up for her. So I hope... Uh, I hope you take the time to watch it. It was a very, uh, very good to talk with her and, and really interesting to hear some of the stories she had to share. And she does also share a lot of messages of thanks towards the end of the video. So um, I'd encourage you to watch along. So here we go. Well, yeah, thank you for taking the time to, to talk with me for a little bit. Thank um, you for making the time available. I appreciate it. Yeah, good. Um, I guess maybe we can start by, do you want to just tell me where, where you are right now? Sure, I'm in Toronto. I'm living in my own house apartment here because a couple of years ago, my nephew and I, we bought a house together. Okay. So he and his wife are living downstairs and I have the upstairs. So I'm very, very thankful to have made that provision and yeah. have my own place to live in here now. Yeah, nice. Um, so I, I guess maybe more for me than anybody in my congregation, but uh, do you, do you want to give me kind of a just an overview of the work that you were doing when you're in Nigeria? Sure. Um, so it changed a little bit over the years when I was there. Uh, I had initially gone as a volunteer uh, for one year, and then um, a few months later, I came back on a on a full time appointment. So the first. Uh, let's see, the first 10 or so years, 11, 12 years, actually, I was, I was actually living in Takum and working with the headquarters of the Christian Reformed Church of Nigeria, um, helping them with their accounting and so on, administrative work. But it grew more and more to be an accounting uh, oversight position. Not that I was doing their accounting for them, but I was helping oversee it I trained the accountant and learned myself actually as well, learned how to do accounting on computer because neither of us had ever done computerized <laughs> accounting okay. before. Yeah. So this, this takes you quite a ways back, of course. This is the late 1980s, early 1990s. Computers are only just beginning to become available. Um, I remember my first computer, in fact, it didn't even have a hard drive. It just had the two separate floppy drives. Wow. That's how far back we go, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but I was with the CRCN then until 2001. And in 2001, I moved to Joss and I took up the position in Joss for our mission. So no longer working directly with the church, but working for our mission there, both World Missions, which is now Resonate, and World Renew, which at the time used to be CRWRC. Mm -hmm. In Joss, we have a combined office, we're a joint field. So I was doing the, um, the financial management and the business management for both World Renew and World Missions from 2001 until my departure last year at the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. So that was my main work um, for the mission. But over time, because the number of missionaries was decreasing, decreasing, the actual work that uh, the time that I spent working specifically and only for our mission was becoming a little less. So I began working more and more again with our partners, both World Renew partners and World Missions partners. So the churches, I maintained contact with the CRCN. Uh, several times I went back down there for a period of anywhere from <laughs> three weeks to 10 weeks at a time <laughs> okay. um, to, to sort of poke my nose into their books again. And then um, several other partners that we had as well, Nigerian partners, Nigerian organizations that um, we, we are supporting with grants and so on um, and in the work that they do. Just again, looking over their shoulders to help them to maintain adequate standards in their accounting 
which in turn would help legitimize them also in terms of continuing to receive grants. Because uh, the first question that any granting organization will ask is, uh, do you have properly audited financial statements? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was where I concentrated probably close to half of my time toward the end was just working with our partners to try to keep them on track in terms of their financial accountability to enable them um, internally to be accountable, but also then in terms of looking externally to be able to apply for grants from other organizations and be seen to be legitimate organizations Great. based on their financial statements. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I guess I, I would not have thought of, of that, but I can see that being really important, especially with access to grant money and, and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yes. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, what, what did you feel was the most rewarding part of the work that you did? Uh, the most report rewarding part was probably also the most frustrating part at the same okay. time. Yeah. Um, I, I am very much a, uh, people would probably describe me as being obsessive compulsive when it comes to detail. Okay. And so it was always very rewarding when my attention to detail had everything coming out to the penny, to the cobo, <laughs> and everything came out well, and the financial statements were, you know, as close as possible to perfect, which yeah. was very rewarding. At the same time, it was very frustrating because in Nigeria, uh, that form of precision does not have a high priority in the culture. <laughs> okay. In fact, the house of language which is the language that I learned to speak when I was there. The Hausa language doesn't even have a word for precise. You can't okay. translate the English word precise into any Hausa word without using a long string of, you know, a whole sentence in order to make the, the translation because it, the concept is not very well formed. Okay. <laughs> so, so a combination there, this, the same one characteristic gave me the greatest satisfaction and in many ways the greatest frustration at the same time. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Is that um, like is that kind of one of the main areas where the cultural difference uh, played into your work quite a bit? Because I can see if you're if you're doing accounting and you're kind of trying to set them up for success in terms of the precision of their books, that being a little bit. Yes, well, certainly that was one. Um, another another big difference that uh, I struggled with it all the years that I was there is um, in Nigeria, it's, it's very much more uh, a relational culture in the sense that people are much more important than organizations are. And so, um, for example, when I give, make charitable contributions here in Canada, my contributions are always to an organization, right? Right. Not to an individual. Whereas in Nigeria, your your charity, it always goes to an individual. Okay. It's far more important to do it that way. And so when an organization, when one of the partners that I'm working with, for example, when they are approached by an individual to say, hey, I've got a problem, there's no hesitation about, wait, wait, wait a minute, this is organizational money, I have to be able to justify giving this to an individual. Right. Uh, the money's in my pocket, I have the resources, you need the resources, I have to give it to you. And that's both a cultural um, idea, a cultural quirk, but it's also then it becomes an organizational quirk and, and that becomes quite difficult. And especially when, you know, coming back to North America, I mean, IRS in the United States and CRA in Canada, they become every year, they become stricter and stricter and stricter on what you may do and what you may not do with your funds. So there, there's a, a conflict that gets set up there just because the cultures are so very different. Mm -hmm. But in line with that, then, I've, I've always been um, just so very impressed with our Nigerian staff and Nigerian friends with how incredibly generous they are with their personal finances. Hmm. I mean, it's very much the case of, you know, the widow's might, the, the people who really don't have much to give, they are just giving and giving and giving. And uh, I'm feeling very much on the side of the wealthy who are, you know, putting a lot more into the coffer, so to speak, but really not out of 
the generosity that I'm giving until it hurts. Right. It is, uh, you know, that's a huge cultural difference there as well. So yeah. something that I, I very much learned to appreciate from, uh, from living and working there is just the, the amazing generosity, generosity in terms of, of personal resources, but also generosity of spirit in terms of forgiveness. Mm. Um, Nigerians are far more likely if someone has offended against them in any way. I mean, just take something as simple as a fender bender on the road. Mm. If someone hits your car, uh, my first reaction is, get where's your insurance? You know, we're going to settle this through the insurance. Nigerians are far more likely to just say, no, no, that's okay. We'll just leave it. We'll just leave it. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was an accident. It was nobody's fault. So I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. <laughs> something like that. Wow. So the generosity of spirit that affects relationships as well as you know their actual um, their actual resources, their actual physical resources. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. What what um, what is maybe something you uh, you have heard or learned from God in your in your ministry time there? I think maybe you've spoken a little bit about that already, but. Yeah, certainly the generosity. Um, I've become much more aware of the the uh, fruit of the spirit, which is called patience. I can't say that I've actually learned all that much patience, but certainly I've become far more aware of my own shortcomings in that field, uh, just by comparing myself to my Nigerian colleagues who are just amazingly patient with you know, most situations that they mm -hmm. come up to. Yeah. So certainly one lesson that uh, I'm still working on that one. That that <laughs> fruit is still a bud <laughs> yeah. in my life, which I hope will become more than just that, even though I've left Nigeria now. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're always, always growing in, in some of these things as time mm -hmm. goes on. So what, um, what led to you making a, a decision to, to end your ministry time in Nigeria? Uh, it was mostly age-related. Um, with the COVID um, problems with travel and so on, uh, I should have been home already uh, about a year ago this time mm -hmm. for my usual home service, but because of um, non-travel from COVID and so on, it got extended. And I was looking at it and thinking, you know, if I take my normal home service now and then go back for another two years. By that time, I'm well past retirement age. Right. So there was that factor. There was the factor that um, a year ago at this time, we were able to um, hire a capable Nigerian who, if we had waited, if I had decided to come back, she would probably not have been available anymore and for the length of time of overlap and so on. It just seemed that uh, there were many different factors that were pointing to, okay, it's time, mm -hmm. it's time, even though I'm not quite up to retirement age by Canadian standards yet. Right. Yeah. Uh, it just felt like it was time for me to hand the torch over to another generation. Yeah. Well, yeah, that sounds like it, it makes sense if it looked like things were working out that way, so. What are your plans for uh, for the, I guess, immediate future and the next couple of years for you now? Well, yeah, that's really difficult now with COVID again. You know, I was kind of hoping that I would be able to make some contacts here in Toronto, maybe find some places to do volunteer work or something like that. Yeah. And so far, of course, that's been completely shut down. Right. So um, I, I'm hoping that there will be organizations that will you know, be able to benefit if they need some kind of volunteer help with bookkeeping, accounting, whatever. I'm, you know, I'm perfectly willing to stand up with that. Yeah. Um, other than that, keeping up or renewing contacts with friends and family and uh, hopefully getting some travel in once the <laughs> restrictions are lifted. Yeah. But yeah. When things calm down. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, are there any other stories or memories from your, your time in, in ministry that you'd, you'd like to share or? Yeah, I was thinking about that question when I saw it, and there's there are just so many, sure. yeah, you know, small, <laughs> small, small memories here and there. I mean, the um, the best memories have to do with my Nigerian friends and colleagues and um, what they have meant to me in those situations and so on. 
Uh, in terms of more recent memories, I guess the one that stands out most at this point is um, the kidnapping of my colleague and mission leader that took place a couple of years ago, two and a half yeah. years ago now. Yeah. And um, the way that especially one of my, well, no, several of my Nigerian colleagues really stepped up to the plate in terms of being very, very, very involved in the negotiations for Mike's release and actually affecting that release and their willingness to put themselves into danger, physical danger um, to, you know, to effect his safe release from the hands of the kidnappers. It was, it was a very um, intense time for all of us. It was about a week. Yeah. And uh, just being able to have the support of the Nigerian community. Mike was my field leader. And uh, there really were not very many of us North Americans on the field. I was relying almost entirely on my Nigerian colleagues in that situation. And they came through 100 mm. 150 yeah. percent it was just amazing to be able to experience that and again um the, the utter reliance we had we were completely helpless of course in that situation so our utter reliance all of us on on yeah. god's provision and god's acting through it all um effecting the release within six days yeah. um many people professional negotiators were amazed that he was released so quickly and with so little uh, difficulty and you know just seeing God's hand going through that whole situation it's just been um, it was very very confirming of faith and of of God's care and providence for all of us in that time yeah well that's quite a quite a story so um, before we before we close our time together is there anything else that you feel you want to share that we might not have touched on or? Sure, um, I, I wish that I could have come in person. Um, of course, at this time it's not possible, but I, I do want to thank the congregation at Holland Marsh CRC for years and years and years of faithful support in every way. Um, and, and not just the financial support, which has been important and of course seems seems like it's the most tangible because it's something that you can actually track but uh, just the number of people in the church who have taken the time over the years to to write letters or more recently send um, uh, send the electronic cards and so on i'm thinking of uh, the beerlings who faithfully every year would send me a christmas card electronically um, <laughs> the Vanderkoys who would send letters and welcome me every time that I was in the church with just hundreds of questions and, and you know, such great interest in, in the work that I was doing. Um, Sarah Van Luke in recent years, since she's been the, the um, local contact for Resonate, a couple of folks who are no longer at Holland Marsh, but who over the years have been very faithful. Emmy Lease has been absolutely the most fabulous correspondent of all. Mm -hmm. And Brenda de Jong before that, you know, but um, other people as well. I remember with great joy and fondness the many uh, potluck suppers that we had together in mm -hmm. the afternoons, evenings before I would uh, be able to do a presentation. Yeah. Uh, Holland Marsh has always been a very welcoming church when I would be on home service yeah. and you made me feel like I was a part of you. So I just am very, very thankful for that. And I really hope I would like to encourage you to uh, continue your relationship with Resonate, if at all possible, you know, to see if they have another missionary somewhere in the world. Nigeria would be nice if you <laughs> could, can maintain that Nigeria connection, but otherwise, you know, any one of the resonate missionaries, it, it just, it does mean a lot. I admit that I've been a lousy correspondent myself. <laughs> uh, one of my big challenges and struggles was maintaining um, relationships with folks in North America. I tend to be much more, I'm here, this is where my relationships are. When I was in Nigeria, I'm there. That was my work focus. And so I admit that I was not a good correspondent, but nevertheless, having said that, I, I would like to acknowledge that the, the correspondence that I did have with 
members of the congregation was always encouraging and uplifting and I was very, very grateful for that. So once again, very many great thanks to Holland Marsh. And if I'm ever in the area, I'd love to drop in and worship with you in person yeah. when the time comes. But um, I think at this time, this is going to have to be our formal, informal goodbye, but not a uh, cutting of all ties, I hope. Yeah, for sure. Good. All right. Well, yeah, thank you for taking the time to, to share with us. And it's really good to hear um, you know, amidst the chaos of the, the last year, how things have come to a close and to hear how God's been working through your ministry. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the time and greetings to everybody. Yeah. We'll, we'll pass that on. Okay, very good.